1941, Hawaii was the center of American peacetime naval operations and considered one of the best assignments for sailor and officer alike. President Roosevelt had issued war warnings to the Pacific on November 27, but they were largely ignored in Honolulu. There had been earlier false alarms. If an attack by Japan came, it would probably be in Singapore or the Dutch East Indies, perhaps even the Philippines, not Pearl Harbor. Somewhere between Washington and Hawaii, a message languished in the hands of Western Union. It was an emergency alert. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. The one nation Pearl Harbor was a stab in the back, a day of infamy. Another, it was a necessity, a desperate act by a people with their backs to the wall. Whichever it was, and historians may argue forever, it was a beginning of this present moment for us all. On July 24, 1941, the Japanese army occupied the rich farmland of French Indochina and moved within striking distance of Malaya, where they would find rubber, and the Dutch East Indies, where there was oil. Japan's self-sufficiency, her new Asian order, was closer to realization. A treaty with the French Vichy government gave Japan Indochina. President Roosevelt froze all Japanese credits in the U.S. and finally imposed an embargo on oil shipments to Japan. By August 1st, all Japanese American trade came to a halt. Japan accused the United States of economic strangulation. The embargo reduced Japan's oil imports by 90%. With only a two-year supply of oil, Japan would soon be forced to retreat step by step until all her gains in Asia were lost. Uh, the Japanese military had staked its whole reputation on this, having seized the foreign policy and pushed it in an expansionist way. Not only would Japan be forced to get out of China and all its gains, but the military would completely lose face at home and probably lose power. It probably meant a shift back to parliamentary rule and so on and a collapse of, of all the hopes of the people that were by this time in power. And they just couldn't do it. We didn't give them any alternatives in between there. We, we were much too rigid at this point. Prime Minister Kanoya, a moderate who wanted to avoid war with the U.S., was forced to resign. War Minister Tojo became Prime Minister and formed a new pro-war cabinet. The tension grew that fall of 41. The Japanese would strike again somewhere, Singapore, Hong Kong, or the Dutch East Indies, and there was worry about the Philippines. A young Korean-American would often drop into my Washington office. He was in touch with the anti-Japanese Korean underground. Pearl Harbor, he kept telling me, before Christmas, he'd get no audience at the State Department. In a desperate attempt at diplomacy, Japan sent a special envoy to Washington, Kurusu Saboro. You all know how difficult my mission is, but I'll do all I can to make it a successful one for the sake of two countries, Japan and the United States. <clears throat> Kurusu and Ambassador Nomura knew that on this same day, November 17, Japan's Pearl Harbor strike force would begin to rendezvous in the Kuril Islands. The government had set a deadline for a diplomatic settlement, November 29th. After that, war with the United States. It would be an adventure against a potentially powerful military force that could lead to disaster. No Japanese thought that Japan could defeat the United States in the sense 
of dictating the terms of peace in Washington. Admiral Yamamoto said, don't start this war unless you're prepared to dictate terms in, in Washington. What he was doing was warning the Japanese, the, uh, the less in, informed people, of the terrible danger of the policy they were starting. Uh, they thought that perhaps if they could knock us out quickly in, in the naval power in the Pacific, giving them a chance to seize the whole of the western half of the Pacific and Southeast Asia and all that, they would then make it so difficult for us to come these tremendous distances against their, or their prepared position that we, with our affluent, soft, flabby life, uh, wouldn't really have the interest or the guts to do it. Secretary of State Cordell Hull knew the meetings were fruitless. He knew that war was inevitable, but he did not know that the Japanese fleet was already underway. About to execute Admiral Yamamoto's bold plan and attack Pearl Harbor. Or did he realize that years ago, there had been some subtle warnings? In 1902, when Franklin Delano Roosevelt was a student at Harvard, a Japanese classmate told him of Japan's 100-year plan to take over Asia and the Pacific. In 1918, young Prince Konoya wrote a bitter essay that warned of British American economic and racial imperialism. In 1924, General Billy Mitchell predicted a surprise Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. In 1925, a prophetic British book called The Great Pacific War described a fictitious war in which carrier-based Japanese planes bombed American cities. In January 1941, Ambassador Joseph Grew learned of Japan's Pearl Harbor plans from the Peruvian embassy. The State Department discounted the warnings, and Secretary of State Cordell Hull continued his rigid hardline stance with the Japanese negotiators, Nomura and Caruso. Hull was sternly moral in his approach. Japan was an aggressor, and he compromised with sanction aggression. Cordell Hull was continuing America's long tradition of loftiness toward Japan. In 1853, Commodore Matthew Perry had sent his intimidating squadron of black ships to penetrate Japan's wall of isolation and open trade with the United States. His methods were firmness, dignity, tact, and guns. The Japanese considered the intruders barbarians. In 1906, President Teddy Roosevelt sent the awesome Great White Fleet to Japan convinced the Japanese that America meant business in the Pacific. In 1921, Secretary of State Charles Evans Hughes challenged Japanese expansion. His successor, Frank Kellogg, virtually ignored the Far East. Secretary of State Henry Stimson was a hardliner on Japan, but not as rigid and moral as Hull. In a sense, Cordell Hull was an unfortunate person to have had in that position at that time. I don't think he was sensitive. Uh, to different points of view, systems outside our own system. He was very rigid on his concept of the law and his concept of what he thought international war law was, and the Japanese had very different views of that, and was not at all sympathetic to discussing basic problems. Cordell Howell was a, a delightful, honorable gentleman, naive as a child about international affairs, whose qualifications for, for presiding over the foreign policies of the United States were almost nil. He knew nothing about the outside world and was not in a position really to understand it even if you tried to tell him. He's a per perfectly respectable, fine person, but this was not his dish. At 6 a.m. November 25th, the Japanese strike force left for its destination, Pearl Harbor. How could it have been stopped? To answer the question, it's again necessary to go back in time. To Versailles, 1919. During the Paris Peace Conference, the Japanese delegates requested that the League of Nations adopt a guarantee of racial equality. President Woodrow Wilson and the Allies refused. 
1924, America passed the infamous Exclusion Act that cut off all Japanese immigration to the United States. In addition, Japanese were forbidden by law to own land in this country. It was an official policy of racial discrimination. As it came to the war, both sides, I think, showed a kind of racial arrogance towards the other side. Now, they, in choosing okay, to go to war, it was a desperate gamble, but that gamble was based on the assumption that we were a weak, flabby people, that we were, in that sense, racially inferior to them, at least culturally inferior. We, on our part, I think, were so absolutely rigid in the way we handled our relations with them. Again, on the basic racial assumption that these little brown people wouldn't really dare take us on. It's all right for them to push Koreans and Chinese and other lesser breeds around, you know, but if they came up against us, that's a different thing. And they would know it, and they wouldn't really dare do it. In the North Central Pacific, Japanese pilots on board the flagship Akagi were briefed on their solemn mission. Each crew member was told to destroy the power of the United States to cheat Japan out of its deserved place on the earth. On December 1st, the command was issued, climb Mount Niitaka, attack Pearl Harbor. The failures of diplomacy would produce this task force, failures that began in 1905. In the Russo-Japanese War, Japan annihilated the Russian fleet at Port Arthur and emerged as a major world power. America denied Japan the fruits of victory when President Teddy Roosevelt negotiated the peace treaty. He manipulated the conference to protect American interests in the Far East. In 1921, at the Washington Naval Conference, Secretary of State Charles Evans Hughes maneuvered the Japanese into accepting a lesser Navy role, a limit of three battleships for every five British and five American battleships. This became known as the 553 ratio, which angered the young Japanese naval officers. It would later prove a source of frustration in Japan. summer of 1921, two Japanese visitors observed General Billy Mitchell's dramatic demonstration of air power when he sank the World War I German battleship Ostfriesland. They said the experiment was profoundly exciting, adding that our people will cheer your great Mitchell and you may be sure will study his experiments. There's much to be learned here. It was ironic that in 1932 and 3, the U.S. Navy held war games off Hawaii to defend Pearl Harbor against a surprise attack. The aircraft carriers Lexington and Saratoga, each carrying 40 planes, would launch their attack at dawn. Schofield Army Barracks, the air bases at Luke and Wheeler Field, and the Pearl Harbor Naval Base. The enemy also launched an amphibious invasion, capturing all of Oahu and Pearl Harbor. In 1932, the U.S. Navy proved that a surprise air attack on Pearl Harbor was feasible. On November 26, the Japanese diplomats Nomura and Caruso requested an emergency meeting with President Roosevelt. The United States had broken the Japanese diplomatic code, purple, and knew the time was running out. 
The Army's brilliant cryptographer, Colonel William Friedman, finally solved the puzzle in September of 1940. From that time on, the U.S. was intercepting and decoding all Japanese diplomatic traffic. Secretary of State Howe knew that Nomura and Caruso had been told to keep talking, but that, quote, after November 29th, things are automatically going to happen. We had many, many signs in the wind that there was going, something was going to happen. Uh, we believed that the Japanese were going to do something. What we didn't know was what and when. It's probably fair to say that it was, it was analyzed properly. It didn't provide enough to be conclusive. It was information that was so sensitive and so compartmented in modern parlance that it wasn't used by enough people so that they could put it in in context to move to kind of an analytical judgment. The problem was, for the intelligence community at that time, and indeed for historians thereafter, is that, that it was ambiguous. And there was so much noise among the real facts, it was very difficult for the intelligence analyst to sort it out. So when it really came down to it, we did not have that key sentence which said, we will attack Pearl Harbor on December 7th. But there was one clue that said December 7th. The November 22nd issue of the New Yorker magazine carried an advertisement which read, Achtung, warning, alert. Above a pair of dice, one with a double cross and the number 12, the other with the number 7. December 7th. The FBI dismissed this still mysterious warning as a coincidence. On November 27th, Thanksgiving Day, President Roosevelt had just rejected Japan's last offer. He would later be accused of leading us into war. I think in a, the loosest or broadest sense of the word, Roosevelt did maneuver us into war in that he created the kinds of dramatic situations by which the American people would be united in case of attack. And then he eliminated options from the Japanese that gave them very little opportunity to do otherwise than to attack us. So in that sense, I think it was his intention that we would go to war, that we would go to war after we'd been attacked. I don't think he maneuvered the specific incidents that occurred at Pearl Harbor. But I think the great fallacy in the argument that he maneuvered us into the war is that if that were his idea, he... he he maneuvered us into, from his point of view, the wrong war. Because Roosevelt's concern was Hitler. That was the great threat. Britain, Russia by this time, after June 22nd, was in the war. But still, the pressure wasn't off in, uh, in Europe. The last thing Roosevelt wanted was a war in the Pacific. Because a war in the Pacific would mean a diversion of American resources, of troops from the main battlefield, which was, which was Europe. Even after Pearl Harbor, there was a great argument between the Europe first strategy and the Asia first strategy. And Roosevelt was always believed that you f deal with Hitler first, then uh, you deal with Japan. The president returned to Washington convinced that Japan would reject his demand that they withdraw from Indochina and China. He then issued war warnings to the Pacific. had received three previous war warnings, and all had been false alarms. Army and Navy commanders in Hawaii interpreted the war warning as an alert to guard against saboteurs and espionage. They thought Japan might attack Singapore or the Dutch East Indies, perhaps even the Philippines, but not Pearl Harbor. The weekend of December 6 began like all others in Hawaii, by the end of that Sunday, however, it would be impossible to forget the day or the event. One remembers clearly that Sunday afternoon, where you were, whom you were with, when the radio brought the announcement. I drove into the city with one hand, the other still trying to button a shirt. Down past the garden of the Japanese embassy, wisps of white smoke drifted in the clear winter air. They'd been burning their papers. The Roosevelts were having a dinner party. Mrs. Roosevelt was presiding. He was upstairs. But he talked briefly with some of the guests. 
I intercepted several as they departed by the mansion door. One of the last was my colleague, Ed Murrow. From their bits and pieces, there was no doubt America had suffered a terrible blow. We do not yet know that about half the firepower of the entire U.S. Navy was crippled. Within one week, the number of nations at war had grown to 35, one half the population of this world. I ask that the Congress declare that since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7th, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. So ended our peace and our years between the wars. That genius of ancient Greece, Archimedes, with his levers and pulleys, said he could move the world if he had a separate place to stand. Woodrow Wilson seemed to think America was that place, and from it he could move and shape the world. America refused to try in the 20s and 30s. Had it done so, had we joined the League of Nations, for example, maybe the world would have shaped up differently but history does not disclose its alternative. Early America was the first great new thing in history in the relations of man to man. Our forebears yearned to preserve its uniqueness. They cut the connection with the old world when they signed the Treaty of Paris in 1783 on this step, ending the American Revolution. Later, Washington and Jefferson warned against permanent and entangling foreign alliance. Later still, John Quincy Adams said America is the well-wisher to the freedom and independence of all. She is the champion and vindicator only of her own. Woodrow Wilson dealt with about 45 nations represented in Washington. Today, emissaries of about 135 countries visit the State Department room, most with hat and demands in hand. America is entangled in military defense arrangements with 47 nations, in economic aid arrangements with over 100. So isolationism is out of the question. The real question is whether our reach has exceeded our grasp. The United States remains a special place, not the separate place. It is in and of the world. Still, a unique obligation rests upon us to guard our own liberty. The freedom of this superpower remains the world's safety net and margin for error. For America to join the ranks of the closed, secretive societies, world tensions could become unbearable. The great danger, the great hope, the great riddle lie where they were in Washington's time, in Wilson's time, in Roosevelt's time. Not in outer space, but in inner man, on terra firma. This is Eric Severide. Thank you and good night.